All right, folks. I'm here, Rick Rapetti, meditating philosopher guy, free will guy, etc. And I'm here with um, my relatively new friend, Christopher Mastro Pietro. Um, thanks to a mutual friend of both of ours, John Verveke, which is how we met. And um, we had one of these great conversations once before, and we said we should have recorded that. So we're recording this. Um, let's see where it goes. Chris, tell us a little bit about about yourself. Ah, uh, thanks, Rick. Uh, this is great. I'm I'm always I'm excited to be talking to you again. Um, yeah, I always I always get uh, it's always difficult for me to do the the, the self spiel because I just I <laughs> never know what's relevant. You know what I mean? It's a funny thing. It's I could I could have a two hour conversation about just that the strangeness of that. Um, I, well, I let like me interject. Let me interject and start you off then. Sure. You co-authored a book with John, didn't you? On I did. Zombies or something. What's the I title did. of that book? I did. I did. What That's is that true. called again? It's called Zombies in Western Culture: a 20, 20, uh, uh, 21st Century Crisis. Um, and uh, and that came out of uh, that. That was the. It was one of those things. John and I had been working together for a very long time. John Verveke and I. I was a student of his years back, and um, and uh, we started to work together on. At the time, it's funny what we started to work on together was really, in some ways, what became "Awakening from the Meaning Crisis," which is a lecture series that he did a couple years ago, and he put up, and it's now being um, being uh, uh, translated into a book that I'm also working with him on oh, now. Awesome. When I heard yeah. that series, I thought this is at least one book. It, it I think it's going to be two. Yeah. It's going to be two. I'm not surprised. Yeah. Well, so I I'm so happy that that's happening. Me too. It's totally mm -hmm. worth book form. Me too. Me too. Many people so, don't watch YouTube, right? But that information is in incredibly important and needs to get out there in multiple forms. So I'm really happy about that. I agree. I agree. And when do you think uh, it'll be um, ready to hand to a publisher. Ball, this ball. well, we're working. We're working with a publisher. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, we're working with a publisher now, and um, and I've I've just kind of rejoined the fray to help see it through um, into kind of in the home stretch of the process. So I've come on now as a third author. Um, and uh, who's and the I'm, second author? Madeline. Uh, oh, Ma Madeline. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, oh my goodness. Her last name escapes me at this moment. Me too. Oh, oh goodness. Sorry, Madeline. Anyway. Um, but Madeline's the, 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 another author as well. So the two of us are basically helping John to, to kind of bring it into that format. And, uh, and that's a great joy for me because when I started working with John years back, we were working on really some version of that, a, a kind of a long form version of his argument related to the meaning crisis, both, you know, from the cognitive, from the sort of the harder cognitive science perspective, um, because, you know, back then the argument was, it was still, when I first met him, there was still a very robust version of it. But of course, since then it has become even more florid and even more detailed than it was at the time. But even then it was, there was quite a lot folded into it. So the process then was to try and translate all of that work, which was basically coming out in his lectures, right? He structured, he still does structure his lectures as arguments rather than expository episodes, you know? So the project at the time was to basically turn that into something like a compendium of all that work. And as we worked on it, you know, it just became clear that it was, it became so huge and so unwieldy and so difficult to keep constrained that uh, it became more and more difficult. So anyway, we basically excerpted a part of that argument and that became the monograph that was zombies in Western culture. And Philip Mischewicz was a third author on that one. Yeah. Um, so uh, what's been so interesting about this work is that there's sort of this great body of it. And, and I think of that great body of it as that there's some kind of, there's some kind of, um, there's some form of that argument that is platonic form of that argument, you know, and each iteration of it is just tries to incarnate it in a new, 
in a new right, version. The form. That's right. That's right. And so each of these papers and articles and book chapters and whatnot that we've done together in the years since then are all just excerpting from that from that central argument. And I think awakening from the meaning crisis is probably, without a doubt, it's the most, it's definitely the most complete long form version of that. So anyway, that was a very long way of saying, yeah, so philosopher guy is actually a good i like i like uh you said it of yourself but uh in a in a less formal sense i guess i could say it of myself and a lot of it has come out of the work with john and just sort of being um being kind of alongside him in that that journey which has been great fun it's been a thrill really yeah i'll mention for anybody who happens to be watching this one of those other projects that you worked on with john that I really appreciated was the Elusive Eye series with you, John, and Greg Enriquez. Yeah. That was really rich, pretty comprehensive, deep. Um, I have a friend who's working on his dissertation on friendship, but where he wants to make the argument that a friend is another self in a way. Uh. And so he's doing a lot of research on what a self is and uh, he's heavily influenced by cognitive science and everything and so i told him you've got to see that and he started watching that and he loves it also <laughs> oh wonderful wonderful thank you for that a, a dissertation on friendship boy that piques my interest uh that's a topic too that uh that that i find fascinating and and it's something that uh that's that's near and dear to me too that that was that series was uh that series was was also that was quite an undertaking because um, Greg and John, and that was my first real exposure to Greg and Greg, like much like John is just a very formidable, comprehensive yeah, kind of yeah, theorist. Yeah. So, so being suspended between those two capacious minds, I mean, I'm very used to John's capacious mind. I know it very well. Um, but uh, but having Greg then on the other side, it was just it was a privilege actually to just be suspended between them, yeah. and uh, and to be uh, and to be a, a happy kind of third wheel in the process. So that was great. That was great. Greg brought in all those fancy, cool looking diagrams too. He's very good at the diagrams. <laughs> I was like, wow, look at that. These are really, you know, a lot of times people use diagrams when they're giving presentations and they're not that helpful, but his were really conceptually very, very lucid. Very. Yeah. I said, this guy's really thought very deeply about this. And he's a psychologist by training, yeah. but he's certainly like incredibly apt as a philosopher. Oh, very much so. And very converse, very conversant with philosophy. Conversant, but the way that he mapped out this phylogenetic tree of knowledge, it's just incredible. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's been very interesting. I mean, he, his work, he's so prolific, Greg. I mean, he's like, talk about, talk about an industrious writer and publisher and whatnot. There's just so much, he has so much material out there. And I think a lot of his material is very helpful too, because it takes, it helps to to translate. I think one of the things that I, I certainly encounter when trying to interface with psychology as a discipline is that it's so multitudinous um, that it's very, very difficult to know, you know, and because there are so many competing and contesting authorities, it's very, very difficult to make sense of that world sometimes. And I, and one thing I really like about Greg is because he has done such a thorough, he's, he's such a thorough survey of literature and of a lot of the relevant perspectives and positions within the field. He's a, he's, he's a very, he's a person who, who brings it all together very well. And so he's a very, he's been a very useful person to know and be exposed to for that reason as well. Much like John does in his domain, you know, they both, both integrative theorists, which is helpful. Yeah. I, I don't want to compare the two of them. Um, but just what you said about Greg, it's really, very obvious to me that his attempt to integrate to come up with a kind of theory of everything about psychological theories each one of which he sees as having limitations and problems and not really being integrated with you know they don't speak to each other but he's kind of brought them all in in, in such an incredible tapestry 
with an integrated, he has a kind of theory about how they all relate to each other. And, yes. you know, it's just really, I couldn't even summarize it without, you know, watching another 20 hours of him lecture a few more times, you know, but he's got that stuff all on his fingertips. So, you know, he's really immersed himself in that project. Um, and, and there isn't a thing I've ever heard him say that I thought to myself, that doesn't ring true to me. Mm. <laughs> mm. The same thing with John. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah, it's the plausibility, right? It's yeah. the plausibility argument. They both just have a great facility with plausibility and a good capacity for, for accommodation and self-correction. Like that's the, I mean, Greg is about as approachable a person as I've met, much like John is. And so there's, a, there's also, there's a temperamental, confluence there too and a temper and the temperamental confluence i think is what makes the whole thing properly socratic there's rigor but there's a real capacity to be challenged and to accommodate the challenge and to respond to it with a, a certain amount of dexterity and a certain amount of openness and uh that's something i picked up from john a long time ago that i that i i tried to model this this uh this ability to really to not be too precious about any one argument. It's funny, it's what made John, it, it's one of the things that makes working with John so much fun, but also challenging, challenging in the in the most rewarding way because the work, that it, at no point does it stop evolving. At no point do the ideas calcify. They're constantly, constantly being vectored by new insights and new inspirations or new encounters, especially now in the last few years, I think it's been especially new encounters like this with people who are themselves formidable and interesting uh, that just that start to vector the arguments and the ideas in new directions. And they never stand still, not for a second. Yeah, I know. And this idea that you can't stand, like the minute you stop, the minute that your thinking stands still, it starts to actually walk backwards. And, um, your that glasses, your glasses start to fog up they start to fog up <laughs> that's exactly right that's so this idea that if you if you stop moving deliberately and thinking deliberately in response to all of those apparatic intrusions that um won't just take your argument lying down the minute you stop being in response to those things you immediately lose whatever relationship you have with the disclosing factor that actually gives this whole project vitality in the first place right something like that very well said christopher yeah and john and greg they really do exemplify that virtue even when they're talking about it, they're exemplifying it. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so that, and that kind of what that, I think what that does too is it rolls into maybe the last thing I'll say about myself and my work with John is this work on Dialogos, which, uh, which obviously you've, you've interacted with too. And I think you already do just as a matter of your, countenance and trade and training i think you you already are in that world um but this idea of trying to um i don't want to say to 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 it's difficult to know exactly what it is and what we're doing because it's so very old and there's an element of newness to it but but whatever it is that's new is just a matter of form i think this idea of of um of drawing back to the socratic tradition in in the in the most in the most um trying to get to the bottom of what it means to cultivate philosophical dialogue and what it means to how much of that is a process that can be managed and directed by process and method and how much of that has to leave itself naked to spontaneity to something chirotic and something unlooked for how much of it is unmanageable and how much of it is manageable and trying to find some kind of dialectic that can capture both uh, and so the whole project of Dialogos that uh, I've been working on with John and with Guy as well, Guy Sengstock, um, 
with his institute is is so much about trying to find a way of reliably conjuring that spontaneous incursion of the logos that actually allows people to turn their attention to whatever it is that's between them um and it's so difficult, but it's so, but when it happens, there are a few things that are more meaningful. And um, so I think the lion's share, at least of the attention right now, is on that project of this project of trying to refine some method. And it's a method that fundamentally John codified first, but that we've been working on together to try and, um, to try and, and, calibrate it properly so that it's not overweening that it's accommodating enough to be able to capture what what is what ought to be spontaneous but at the same time that it's rigorous enough to be replicable you know across time and across groups of people and that project is fascinating and uh and having done a few of those workshops obviously you you kind of uh you you were there for one of them and so could kind of see the experiment in action. And it very much is experimental in the sense that there's a laboratory to this and it's trying to figure out how to how to adjust the constraints properly. And anyway, that's been a very interesting process. How about the fascinating process? And that was an excellent description of it. And it's been puzzling to me exactly what it is that goes on when that's working and how to even describe it accurately to other philosophers, let's just say, who have never really tried that kind of dialogue. Yeah. You know, like what happened at the Circling Institute that I attended that you and John and um, Guy led. I missed the last one, I couldn't make it, but I've done other um, dialectic to dialogos type things and philosophical fellowship practices with um, Robert Gray, who's part of that community. Yes, Robert. I've done a handful of those with him and his, some of his friends. And um, John was at one or two of those, one of those also. Um, but I've also done some of the um, philosophical fellowship, um, although he calls them philosophical companionship practices that uh, Ron, Lahav, Ron Lahav I've done a few of those with him that are very similar and they're all really wonderful practices, but it's, it's just really hard for me as somebody who's kind of, it's kind of like going from Shotokan to maybe Jiu Jitsu or some or mixed martial arts. So I have this one very long standing training in analytic philosophy, but this approach is so much more fluid and, you know, open ended and unexpected. And it's almost like, hoping that the muses possess you and poetry comes through you while you're doing philosophy. And um, it's so different, but it's so powerful and moving. Um, you know, I haven't gotten the language for it yet, but I trust it and I love, I love doing that kind of work. One analogy that I'll make um, with meditation practice, do you, do you have a, a, a longstanding meditation practice? I'm just curious. I have a... To be to be very frank, I have an on again, off again relationship with meditation practice. I do have some history with it, okay. and uh, and uh, and John's training has informed that quite a bit in the past. But I haven't been quite as rigorous at sticking well, to it as I, I would was like. Just curious if you had any experience with it. Some enough to know of what you speak. Okay, good. So and and um. So I was on a, the integral stage just a few days ago with um, Bruce Alderman and uh, Layman Pascal. And uh, I've been on there a few times. John, when he met me, told them, you have to meet him or something like that. Or they told John, we have to meet him. I forget who, who said it to who. And rightly so. I've been on there a few times. And um, the last, this last one was where we were all talking about our actual meditation experiences. Um, let's say what, normal and kind of super normal ones. Um, and um, we were trying to parse, you know, like what meditation practices that we were, let's just say, in disciplined practice of 
that we think led to certain kinds of experiences that we had like extraordinary experiences because meditation if you have a long-standing meditation practice you're likely to have really unique extraordinary exceptional kind of experiences just like a dialogos experience might feel almost supernatural or like a possession or something like that right so um i i don't remember if it was bruce or layman one of them said that they heard this from Ken Wilbur, who they thought heard it from Alan Watts, um, this analogy that, because, uh, you know, what's the difference? Look, like, you know, you do these practices and then you have these experiences, but do the practices cause the experiences, right? And um, the idea, originally, I suppose, from Alan Watts, was these experiences, these bizarro, mystical, noetic, Gnostic, transformative, transcendent, you know, plato neoplatonic experiences of the one or whatever, the logos or whatever it is, right? They're, they're, they just happen to you. They're kind of like accidents, right? They just happen. They're not something that you do. You might be doing something when one of them happens, but often they just happen to you when you're kind of sitting in meditation or even when you're not sitting in meditation. But the quote goes something like this, but meditation practice makes you accident prone. Ha ha ha, you're right. Okay, so that was a kind of long-winded analogy, but um, yeah, something about these practices, whether you think with it this way, that way, whether it's the way Ron Lahav does it or the way you and John and Guy are doing or the way Guy's circling, and then there's the philosophical fellowship, there's this, there's that. You blend a few of them together. They all kind of work, and yeah. the more you do any of them, the more prone you are for that dialogos thing to happen. Right. And sometimes the conversations go around and, you know, you're not quite sure if you got there. Yeah. But sometimes you do. And it just happens really kind of everybody's in the zone, everyone's in the flow, and the thing just kind of becomes greater than any one of the participants in it yes. somehow. Yes. Or with the logos, but what does that mean, you know? Uh, what does <laughs> what does that mean? I know. I <laughs> makes you accident prone i that's that's excellent that's like what a perfect what a perfect way of of capturing both and, I, and what that does i think that analogy or i don't know is that an analogy it's not it, i guess it is an analogy it's sort of an analogy from meditation practices to transcendent experiences to right. the dialectic to dialogos type right. practices and and those transcendent experiences. right that's right that's right that's right because that captures exactly this this very kind of um it captures the need to somehow the agency the agency that's willing to give of itself and give itself up right that 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 i i always i always draw back to i always draw back to to this idea and it's an idea i think that this it's present in in all of the above traditions, but I always think of a formulation of it in Kierkegaard where, you know, this idea that you have to, you, you must, you have to give up to gain, you know, you give up yourself to gain yourself. And, and, and there's something about softening your attention um, that is an invitation to the uncanny a little bit. And that if you become susceptible to noticing certain kinds of patterns, those kinds of patterns will will pronounce themselves to you, which isn't to say they weren't there, but they are made more real by virtue of the attention paid to them. And then all of a sudden, there's a relationship to them, whereas before they may have only been incidental. I think of it to kind of add another analogy or an, an, an example of that analogy is uh, I think I mentioned to you last time we chatted in the last couple of years, I've 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 been undertaking um, kind of a m more of a Jungian analysis process of paying far more attention, doing far more dream work, paying much much more attention to that realm of imaginal activity. And one of the things I found, 
And maybe it should have been obvious to begin with, but I, I had a lot of trepidation going into that because I thought, well, I, I never remember these, you know, and they don't really come to me. And I'm not a particularly prolific or vivid dreamer. They're, they happen once every couple of years. There's a really good one. And then it's like a drought for the next few years. One thing I found, though, that as I started to pay attention to them, they gave of themselves. They emerged, right? They started to they they answered the invitation in other words right the attention paid was as an invitation and they responded in kind by making Can themselves more that? memorable and knowable and so there's something about that that they, I, it became more accident prone i think in just the sense that you mean there's something of a of a of a, of a connection there intention and selective attention are very highly related to each other but I'm curious how you started paying attention to your dreams. Was it just an intention to do that? And to like you were started stalking yourself, looking for them, falling asleep, thinking about it, wanting it to happen, you know, like what kind of, do you remember the phenomenology of what that meant for you in any way, shape or form? Because it could just be the intention. Uh, just I think the the, alone is, is a key factor. I think it did start with that. I think it really did start with that. I think that the intention, I'm trying to remember now, but I think that the intention preceded the first instance, um, which maybe is very telling. The intention to pay attention preceded the first instance of having something to pay attention to. And then the attention paid to that seems to precipitate the process more. And so they came more reliably um, as I think as a consequence of that, you know, it's very difficult to talk about these things in terms of cause at causal relationships, which is why in that tradition, we don't talk about it in terms of causal relationships, but that, that accident prone thing. Yeah. The accident proneness. Yeah. 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 There's a way in which intending wanting something to become salient for you that's aspirational yes that makes it salient for you so that you're now on the lookout for anything that might open that up right. in you and that that might not be conscious how that unfolds as you're lying in bed falling asleep they might that hypnagogic imagery starts coming you still have a little bit of minimal consciousness but now you've got that intention Yes. And that might be what kind of makes you ripe, uh, doesn't necessarily cause, but makes you ripe for a significant dream that you can remember. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. And both waking and not waking, too, because I think that that same, that same attention paid to unconscious dream life is then also becomes paid outwardly to the world, you know, in everyday waking life too, right? Just being able to pick things up, being able to see those apparently minute coincidences that are really anything but that are, um, that are, that are instances of a pattern that is being lived out over and over again. And being then being able to catch yourself in a pattern, living something out that was invisible in its geometry, but that suddenly seems to be showing its mark markings, you know, as though they're as like, like a like a set of hidden runes on the sidewalk or something like like there's something like that paying attention to those patterns, and it's something that happens gradually and incrementally, and so, and then sometimes dramatically in a moment, but but usually only as the product I think of a long gradual process of intention as you say and suddenly one day i mean i've been i've been finding that a lot lately um that things that perhaps should have been obvious for a very long time but weren't have simply become obvious because of when when a process that starts with in the kind of intention you describe followed by careful repetitious attention actually materializes into an insight that makes sense of months, if not years worth of life lived. Yeah. Um, Layman in talking about our meditation practices the other day, 
he described how there was a time for him where he found himself in this, uh, it was very hot, and his body, mind, whatever, his being, turned into a kind of inquiry about the heat and how mm. he could deal with it. It wasn't a conscious question, but it, it was a kind of, as if his consciousness was in an inquiring mode about being so hot and how to deal with it. And he, he says something like, and just that kind of awareness felt like a question, like an inquiry. Mm. And he kind of hacked it in a way and thought, maybe I'm just a bunch of inquiries. And if I can articulate them, maybe they'll sort of resolve in some way. Yes. So he sat there for four hours, I think he said, just like articulating and manifesting somehow all the questions which were his like existential being uncertain or something like that. I forget how he described it, but it was really a really interesting, it was a very interesting thing that made, that sprung up in my mind as you were describing how having an intention to have meaningful dreams, let's just say, can spark a process with continued intention and attention that can just sort of answer unresolved questions in your life. And it, yeah. it made me think of tip of tongue phenomenon where you can't think of someone's name and you're trying hard and then you stop trying and then it comes to you, right? Mm -hmm. So that's part of intention. I've got the intention, but it's not working right now. I release the intention and then the something else in me answers the question. Now, I've had many times in my life where I was struggling with something and I, I can't even put my finger on it and give a concrete example, but I know that this has happened to me where I've had a series of dreams and I woke up and I didn't feel like that was a problem anymore, but I couldn't remember the dreams, you know, this kind of thing. So my psyche integrated to, it had been working on resolving this on a level that I was not consciously aware of, That's right. you know? That's right. um, and I think that happens in life in many different ways. If you are inquiring in layman's sense, somehow with intention and attention, even if it's not direct or clear or articulate or conscious, but you're living a kind of inquiry, you're yeah. trying to solve certain existential, whatever they are that, you know, we, a lot of these things can't even be verbalized, like, you know, like nihilism, somebody might be struggling with, but not be able to put it into words. Absolutely. You know, and then something happens and, you know, something, sh they have certain experiences where maybe they just feel friendship or something, something nutriment of the soul happens and they go, oh yeah, there is value in existence. Yes. Right? But they might not even process that consciously, but they just, they shift out of it um, because they're looking for meaning yeah. <laughs> on some level. Yeah. doesn't have to be conscious. Yes. Yeah, I like that young Ian thing. I also remember um, when I was doing Gestalt psychotherapy work as a client. I did a couple of years as a student, and one year as a as a uh, therapist, because the second year of training you had to be a therapist uh, under supervision. My therapist was really into dream work, and she would often ask me if we, we you know. We were supposed to be in counseling once a week when we were students, but I continued it even after the, I stopped going to the school because I loved the work um, on and off throughout the years. I'd go for three years, stop for a year, whatever. And um, it's, it's like martial arts or something. It's just good. It's food for the soul or the body or whatever. But she's really, she was really into dreams. And sometimes I just show up because, you know, you, you have a schedule, you want to go every week. That's the, the deal, you know, even if you don't have anything that you're working on. So you go in, you sit there and you, you make this eye contact. You're just a few feet away from each other. And she's like totally empty, like a sponge and looking at me like an enlightened being because she, she's very spiritually evolved. She leads a meditation group and everything. And like, I have nothing to talk about, like nothing's coming out of me and it's very awkward and everything. And like out of compassion to give me something to talk about, maybe she would say, have you had any dreams lately? <laughs> and then I would like, okay, a lot of times I go, nothing that I remember. Well, what's the last one that you remember? 
right? It doesn't have to be recent, right? And I would like, and we would just start talking about the dream and playing around with it and it became incredibly rich. No matter how stupid or meaningless I thought that dream was, there was so much meaning packed into every little detail of it. Yeah, yeah. And it's not like, oh, here's a book of translations where that means this and that means that. No, 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 no. no. We're, yeah, we're just discovering, you know, because I created those dreams. So I am the source of their meaning. That's right. <laughs> and she's just helping me excavate that meaning um, because she's good with dream work, you know. Right. That stuff is fascinating. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's beautifully said. That's... Uh... It's related, though, to this thing about intention and attention. Because it absolutely... The more, it, the more that she would do that to me, the more I was having dreams. Then. Right, right, right. And, like, something in me would wake me up when I was having a meaningful dream so that I could remember it. Yes, I find that... I find, have that experience, too. <laughs> Isn't it the that's damnedest thing? That's a function of intention. That's Isn't it the, I want to. Yeah. to. I'm, I'm putting in requests to the computer yeah yeah and it's sending them you know it's delivering them exactly <laughs> it's like a search, it's like exactly. A search or something it <laughs> is it's well it's it's kind of like taking a lantern down into the cellar right and it's yeah. like that, sometimes it is the cellar yeah sometimes it really is the cellar <laughs> oh, it truly is the cellar but that light <laughs> that light of conscious intention applied to a domain of experience that is chaotic and unruly and bucks interpretation, certainly bucks consistent interpretation, is the beginnings of a very profound kind of intra-psychic dialogue, right? And it's one that has to play out over a long period of time. It doesn't happen in short order, but it really does evolve. It gathers it gathers, it gathers, and each new instance of it, each new instance, each new installment or episode of that kind of dialogue is gathered up into the kind of emerging totality of something that's slowly, with the right kind of attention, coming into distinction. One of the things I love about the dream work is that because you begin to think of the because because it's not just the dream I and the dream that is you it is the entire world of the dream that is you right you're a coextensive with the world itself and therefore your phenomenological experience of that world is coextensive with everything that is real of you and and one of the things I found most interesting and rewarding about training attention to understand that coextension is by porting that back into waking life and realizing that my experience of the world, even if it, even the edifice of the world that seems apart from me, is still coextensive with my attitude that is producing it. Yeah. And, and this idea that, um, that the world is backlit by us, it's backlit by our attention and intention. And it tells us if we're paying attention to its figure and its coloration, it tells us everything we need to know about what we are living in and through and living out too. And so starting to see the waking world in the way that we see the world of a dream is actually, I find very helpful because we realize that our attention is coextensive with it and producing it before our eyes. Right. And then as you say, or, or as uh that that beautiful analogy of becoming accident prone, then I think it be, that accident proneness becomes a way of periodically waking up in the midst of that kind of dream, you know, the dreams that we have in waking life. Absolutely. Yeah, two things. One, I want to talk about lucid dreaming and lucid waking. And then I want to ask you a question about since you're a Jungian about the collective unconscious, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about that okay. um, because of things like synchronicity and all that, that stuff fascinates me. And I've had a lot of experiences, you know, that fall under that umbrella. So yeah, you know, there's a kind of dream yoga thing and Castaneda, Carlos Castaneda practiced some kind of dream waking, crossover stuff uh, you know this 
Uh, traditions aside, because I don't want to get into the technicalities of different types of things that might be considered dream work or dream yoga, but you're, you're absolutely right that the more you do something that borders on or becomes something like conscious dreaming, you know, where your intentions and your consciousness and your attention are kind of penetrating into this dream part of your being. And then, like you said, you know, this is one of the things that uh, I discovered doing dream work with my Gestalt therapist, that the entire world in my dream is me. <laughs> I'm not just the character in it, like with the, um, you know, semantic memory that I, or, you know, episodic memory where I was, I was the vantage point and that was happening to me. No, the whole environment, the place where I was, all of that is me. Yeah. It's all because I created it. So it's, it's all part of me. Right. But yeah, you're absolutely right. There's a there's a totally analogous way in which all of my waking experience is a function of my selective attention. It doesn't mean that there's no world out there, but everything that's salient for me that my relevance realization <laughs> apparatus is pulling in yeah. it's based on my what the uh, Asians would call my karma, you know, my level of my just my volitional you know, level of evolution, all the, all the, uh, you know, auto poetic processes that I've invested in and all that stuff, it's all kind of looping back. But, um, so in, in dream yoga or in like, you know, let's we'll stick with the dream yoga thing, not just the Castaneda thing, cause that's a little more supernaturalistic. There are practices of, and Evan Thompson, I, I think you might know who he is. Yep, well, he's yep. a colleague of John's. Um, at the University of Toronto, he wrote that book. I don't know if you read it. Dreaming, be dreaming, waking, dreaming, being. Mm. I forget the subtitle. Something about the philosophy and psychology of consciousness, or something like that, or meditation and whatever. Um, he talks about this in there. Um, but there's this whole practice of trying to cultivate waking intentions. The kind of meditative or contemplative practices and visualizations and intention forming practices that will make you lucid dream prone, like accident prone, right? Like I remember Castaneda, I think it was Castaneda's example uh, that Carlos told him, you know, as you're falling asleep, try to think of seeing your hands in your dream because your hands represent your volitional control over things. And so, you know, you put that intention in there and then at some point in a dream, you will see your hands and then you'll remember that ah, now I'm here and I'm, I'm conscious in my dream. Right. So you'll have a lucid dream. That's just one example of a whole variety of techniques that people practice to try to create lucid dreaming. So if you can have a lucid dream, that means where, you know, you're in a dream state without waking up. Normally, when you realize you're dreaming, you wake up. Yes. Right? Yes, this is a way of kind of staying in the dream, you know, yes. intention. so you you're literally projecting your intention into your dream mode and it and, and you get there with consciousness and then you don't have to wake up and then you can play with this imaginal space yes. while you're in the mode that creates dreams and you can do it intentionally. That's really freaky and fun. Um, but the more that you I, this is my personal theory, and I think this is, well, I mean, I should say, I think it's true, but I also think it's part of the dream yoga and Tibetan Buddhism. They have things, versions of this, where the more that you're able to lucid dream, the more prone you are, like accident prone, to lucid waking, which is the thing you were talking about when you said, I realize even when I'm in the waking state, I'm in this lucid, I'm conscious of the ways in which I'm co-creating this this experience beautifully said yes lucid yes waking. and enlightenment i think is a kind of total lucid a total lucid waking total lucidity no matter what mental state you're in yeah waking, dreaming being dreamless whatever meditating writing dancing walking talking washing dishes whatever yes so i i am awake right that yeah. i mean that awake. the canonical right awake. right the Buddhist canonical yeah, state. I am awake. Aware. Yeah. So yeah, I wanted to just share that um, riff on what you said, and I think we're uh, getting a little bit. That's of that's beautiful. That's beautiful. 
But my question is, what do you think about like the metaphysics of Carl Jung's? I mean, I know it's a it's like a bomb to throw at you. It's a oh. little unfair, but but you are a youngie, and and I've had so many. I mentioned this to John. You might have heard me say this on a couple of these shows that uh, I've had a lot of experiences that you know they're mystical, of course, they're meditative, whatever. Some of them seem to be precognitive. Some of them seem to be, let's just say, paranormal. I don't mean necessarily supernatural, but not normal. They are paranormal. Um, but I, there was also a, a period of my life, and, and this is something that came up in my talk with uh, Layman and Bruce the other day, when I had such a serious period of my life where my meditative and contemplative practices were so intense that I was having these kinds of I was accident. I was so accident prone that it was just. I was in a four-year accident. Uh, all, I was in a flow state or alter states almost all the time. When I was in that mode, synchronicity was the norm for me. Absolute, like so many things were, multiply synchronous, you know, meaningful coincidences. When multiple, multiple, multiple. It's like nonstop. It was almost like I was constantly precognitive almost you know it just got to the point where it was it, it was constant altered state flow with synchronicity is the lightest way of describing what that was like so I, you know I, I talk to mystics or some of my friends from the cult I'll just call them you know, the sanghas that I used to belong in where, you know, around a guru or whatever, and they're into Hinduism or Buddhism. And they say, oh, well, you know, they've got that totally supernatural view. Right. But folks like John and you have a you, you, you try at least to be naturalists about these things. I know John does. Anyway, yeah, John is a self-professed naturalist. He is. He and, is. Yeah. yeah. And I say in, in my writings on free will, which you had mentioned before we started the recording that we, we maybe we would talk about free will. But in my writings on free will, I mean, I've had so many experiences that make me think something like supernatural might not be wrong. I don't know what the metaphysics of it is, but the the physicalist version of reality seems in, inaccurate or incomplete to me based on right. all the experiences that I've had. But when I'm communicating with scientifically minded people, uh, analytic philosophers, ordinary folks who are rational and sane, uh, I try to share whatever knowledge, insight, wisdom, elements of it, what little bit that I have in as naturalistic a mode as I can. Right. So because I think it's all valuable, even if we're in a completely naturalistic world. It, it is. And it has Socratic value, independent of how ultimate it is as a metaphysical worldview. It has it has absolute Socratic value and rigor to do that. Right. And I think it's important to be able to couch all of those things in naturalistic terms so that I don't lose anybody. Yes. And it, exactly. I, I want to help people who might be on the fence about the value of something like meditation or who might be confused about free will. So I don't think you need to believe in a supernatural soul to think you have free will, let's just say. Then folks like Sam Harris will say, ah, oh, you know what, there's no soul, so there's no free will. Or that's one of the arguments, you know, yeah, so it's yeah. really the idea, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I always well, you've, summar you've, you've definitely summarily argued your like you you've you've offered you've offered a, a a very compelling response to that argument in your paper as i told you like i think you've you've kind of i think you've summarily dispatched the idea that belief in an immortal soul is necessary a necessary condition for belief in free will and i think what you're doing if you if i can be so presumptuous i think part of what you're doing when you describe it's part of why I think it's so Socratic what you're doing, because, you know, there's a certain amount of irony. Again, you, I want you to tell me if I'm if I'm if I'm, my, I'm on a cold trail here, Rick, but I, I sense a certain amount of irony in your relationship with your work, because I think that when you enter into doing the kind of exacting analytic work that your paper exemplifies, for instance, you're undertaking a certain trade to become communicable with those people 
who are who live inside a particular metaphysics. And you're trying to make yourself conversant with them under that canopy. It doesn't mean you live under that canopy necessarily, or maybe you spend part of your time under that canopy as an itinerant philosopher. But you're able to sidle over and duck under that canopy with them, just as Socrates does in the cave. You know, I mean, it's a very, very classic. But I mean, it's a, I, it that that's like this is a very, very classic and ancient philosophical motif, right? And I think in every Socratic dialogue, what Socrates is the lone, um, lucid. He he's 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 the lucid dreamer amidst a group of people who are all still unaware that they're dreaming, right? I think I don't think that's a stretch to carry that analogy over to the forum. Very and different. and so what he's doing is he's he's implicating himself in the metaphysics that everyone else is living in and living out, even though he remains outside of it. He's costuming himself in the same clothing and he's entering in but he's doing so ironically, and he's doing so to try and, from within, from the inside, gently redirect the attention of his interlocutors in the hopes that at one point, if they, if they model his form of inquiry, they will find themselves momentarily awake inside of the metaphysical dream, right, in which they live. Momentarily unstuck momentarily from a, unstuck. from a view right yeah. right right you said at the very beginning i don't even remember if this was before or after we put the recorder on something about becoming a little more softer in yeah that? softening attention softening porous attention. like a porosity yes so yeah I think that unfortunately the norm for the average person who Socrates interlocutors kind of represent is that their 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 kind of um, their cognitive framework is not soft at all. It's yeah. quite structured and rigid, and it's given, and they don't see it. They see through it as Ex said. exactly exactly right. So so Socrates' yeah. work is to get them to kind of notice the contours of their lenses a little bit right. just like you would in meditation teaching yeah. meditation yeah. Right? yeah is this what you believe why do you believe that what is that yeah what what is that explain that to me what is that? <laughs> yeah what's that about how do you define that yeah what is that <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly is that what it is oh i but, but didn't you say you know this other thing <laughs> exactly exactly Exactly. And that Socratic irony, which is the realization that the sacred and the real is not necessarily the given at any moment in time, is something as a trait I detect in. It's a trait I detect in you and your work a little bit in the way that, you know, you're entering into the philosophical arena in the most formal analytic sense to operate inside those bounds. And that doesn't necessarily mean ultimately a faith in those bounds but it does mean a capacity and a facility to work within them because there's great necessity and dialectic i guess a kind of dialectical necessity to work to be able to work within them or something like that rick um that sounds right so you had a question for me i want to yeah, know what that question is oh it was about the unconscious the collective unconscious What's your conception of what Jung means by that? Mm. You don't need to give a full metaphysical account, just to kind of, what's your sense of, of what that means? Yeah. It's, like, kind of like, it's kind of like asking John, what do you mean by logos? You know, it's a deep, yeah. it's a good question. And I'm not trying to pull a Socrates on you and turn you into one of Socrates interlocutors. Um, Cause no, it's just a genuine curiosity of mine. But I, I, I think that I've, swam in that collective unconscious many times yeah. i just don't know exactly what it is or how to understand it like i said oh my my hindu friends will say oh that's like the mind of god or something like that you know and there's all that metaphorical language mm -hmm. uh you know 
And Jung was obviously trying to be some kind of naturalist by just calling it a collective unconscious. Yeah. In some way, right? That's not like calling it a universal mind or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But if it's an unconscious, it is a mind in some way. It Yes. And if it's collective, then we're all connected with it. Yes. And so... Yes. And that analogy of the mind of God, I think, is in many ways, in so many words, pretty consistent with Jung's metaphysics. You know, I, I, Jung's very heretical, I suppose, ideas about our relationship to the Godhead and the fact that becoming conscious and individuating oneself, becoming a self, as it were, and developing the access to that substrate whatever its nature, is a project not only for oneself, but somehow a project for God, which is a, just a bizarre, like I have to contort myself into all kinds of weird positions even to fathom that, this idea that to become oneself is to create, is to create a reflection for God that he might better know himself. It's an extra, like it's an extraordinary idea and it's as beautiful as it is scandalous to me. But this idea that the project of becoming conscious in the way that the Jungians endeavor to, at least if they're kind of, if they're sniffing out the right trail, is somehow not just a project for oneself, but that the project of knowing thyself is also the project of, of creating what is real again such that it is more real than it was so and transpersonal and transcendent and it's part of god's emanation and return to god's self in right. some sense right exactly which makes jung so profoundly neoplatonic Neoplatonic, yeah. he's so bloody neoplatonic you know and i know people say he's kantian and that's true he's very kantian but i think he's to me, he's a, he's just such a Neoplatonist and a mystic and whatever. And I think that he did kind of what I've what I've what I fondly accused you of doing in a comp as a compliment, which is that he he had that naturalistic. He could put on those vestments and he could put them on very well and he could operate within that arena. But I think that he, too, had a great deal of irony in doing so and i think that he knew that he had to play the politics of his time to some degree and he had enough humility to know that whatever account he gave was a representational account and not an absolute one and that's why i think he he eschewed the idea of being doctrinal or dogmatic in his typologies like but at least by my understanding i mean i think a great deal of him as you know and so i i you know i'm not the best person to look to when it comes to uh, uh, criticizing him but but i think that um one thing i think that he always maintained is this idea that you know he, he i mean he he's he's so systemic in some ways in his thinking about how he categorizes and classifies and typologizes things but i think that there's always an awareness underneath all of that that all of this is just sort of an approximate representational schematic of something that cannot be rendered in this form in toto the the way that you can't confuse the, the archetypal image for the archetype right that what we're talking about is some kind of some ineffable pattern or constituent of of conscious life and experience that we can only approximate by vesting it into moving images and that our relationship with it is vectored through these moving images that are these symbols but that what they're doing is they're trying to they, you know the hand Right, that 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 lantern that descends into the cellar, the 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 hand that's trying to grope its way, and find some kind of hold on what is real is 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 gathering, you know, it's it's gathering together some kind of um, some kind of excerpt of that pattern, rather than ever being able to estimate its its totality. Um, I don't think I'm answering your question at all as I say all of this. Oh, I think um, you are. I think you are. Um, Not just excerpting something from the cellar, but also fishing 
in the ocean of the uncon the collective unconscious. Yeah. And the, some of the big fish in there are the archetypes, and those are friends of Plato's forms, I, I think. Oh, they are. If not, if not, if not identical, I dare yeah. say. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I, just, I can't. I, I'm. I, I sometimes think I'm just maybe I'm not rigorous enough to find the differences, <laughs> but I truly think that at bottom I can't find the differences. You know, I always thought that they were the same, or at least, well, like, you know how there are generations of Greek gods, you know, like the Titans and whatnot, and you know the muses or the daughters of Zeus, you know, so like maybe the archetypes and the forms, they're like generations of, of platonic things, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know what levels they are because I'm not an expert on either Neoplatonism or on Jung, but uh, that's my intuition that they're, they're definitely in the same league. They're related to each other, at least if not identical, like you said. Yes, yes, yes. And, and that, you know, and, Boy, Rick, your question is so bloody timely, and I, I synchronicity is something that's been on my mind a lot for especially the last uh, month or so, um, because uh, I had one recently that was that was like very um, that was quite potent, and um, and. A few months back, I read uh, 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 Bernardo Castro uh, wrote a short little book. It's a great little book. It's like, boy, it's like what a – it's uh, on Jung's metaphysics called – I think it's uh, Decoding Jung's Metaphysics. I just asked you about Jung's metaphysics. Great little book. Like I really that's synchronicity right well, there. <laughs> absolutely. And, I like um, Bernardo Castro. I like him too. And, and, you know, and I think he really, he's an, I think if I've understood him right, I think he's an apologist for, for understanding Jung's metaphysics robustly as at a kind of objective idealism and, and understanding it very much as uh, understanding psyche as a kind of arche, as a kind of substrate, as a, as a fundament um, of which matter and materiality is a property no less real, no less real for being so secondary, but secondary. And, you know, the more and our individuation is also secondary, according to Castro. Yes, that's right. That's right. And I find something. First of all, I find a great beauty and elegance. And, you know. I mean, it's funny, John always talks about the, the you know, the hermeneutics of beauty rather than the hermeneutics of suspicion. And right. if that is a guide, justly, I find a great deal of beauty and elegance, um, an aspirational elegance to that kind of account. I find it the more beautiful. And uh, again, and someone could say very Socratically, well, you know, it, beauty and beauty and I don't know, veracity are not the same thing. But if we're thinking in platonic terms, the good, there's, the true, and the beautiful are the same. There's a continuity, exactly. There's a continuous nature between these. And so, and that's something that to follow. Um, quick, quick interruption. Yeah. I read years ago, I think it was a book called The Eye of Shiva, but I don't remember. It was like 40 years ago. I was a teenager when I first started getting into meditation. I think I read this in that book, but I also read it in the fictional novel called The Celestine Prophecy. I don't know if you ever read that. No. In, but it's a really great fi fiction. Um, some fiction seems more real than real, just like some dreams are ontonormative, you know? Um, totally. But uh, the idea was that the more spiritually evolved you become, the more beauty you are prone to perceive. Yeah. Wow. And, yeah. yeah. So, and that makes sense in a platonic, um, you know, world. Absolutely. That rings about as true as anything yeah. could. The more anagogic you become, the closer your perception, your apprehension of the real, the true, and you know, the true, the, the good, and the beautiful are. So That's right. That's right. I interrupted you. Go, no, no. God, what a great interruption that was. Thank <laughs> you. Um, that's a, what a beautiful observation too. And I think it's, and it rings with experience. It yeah. really does. And not only the aptitude for noticing beauty, but also the aptitude for connecting in in the in the sense of the symposium, you know, in the sense that's articulated by, you know, diatema is this idea that 
that that the continuity of nature between that beauty that is material and that beauty that is the elegance and coherence of intelligibility um that they are somehow ba- bound bounded together and that rebinding them has ever and that synchronicity i think is is in a sense a way of rebinding in realization, the continuity between those things. There is a great affinity, I think, between both claims. What's his name? Uh, the Muslim, Arabic, theologian, mystic, philosopher, Sufi. What was his name? Al-Ghazali. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. I've heard of him. Around, around the time of Maimonides. I forget what century, but, you know, medieval. He said something like the more spiritually evolved you become the difference in fact his the where he writes about it it almost sounds like descartes plagiarized him (laughs) in the first meditation when descartes talks about yeah the dream argument and whatnot and the evil demon argument all these things a lot of those ideas come right out of the same passage in al ghazali where he says spiritual awakening is to ordinary waking consciousness what waking consciousness is to dreaming which is like the child is to the man uh, with man is, to, man the is to the sage yes but al Ghazali says when you're at that level that spiritual sagacious level you have synchronicity experiences and precognitive experiences all the time yeah. so because you're closer to the real and the I true do. and but that's the same as being closer to the the beautiful the beautiful the yeah. two the two ideas are uh, the same idea manifest one in in terms of like just the the ontonormativity of synchronicity because the world is structured in that unique way that shows up synchronous in, in synchronicity whatever that is that's yeah. like the magical oneness of all things yes. you know that's all processing in some kind of way which transcends ordinary reason but which is like kind of mathematically beautiful the way mathematicians love are you know the art of numbers or Einstein, the beauty of the laws of nature, That's you know, right. they're all getting closer to something and there's a similar, a similar aesthetic. That's to right. It all. That's yeah. right. That's right. Right. And, and what they do is they, they bind together those things that in, especially in sort of the metaphysics du jour are like the subject object metaphysics du jour remain very much unreconciled. Um, which makes them properly symbolic, right? Because they bind, I mean, literally the symbol on that connects what's interior with what's exterior or what's what's the ideality of a person's, the, the recesses of a person's thoughts that appear to be epiphenomenal and, you know, and, and stranded in a chaotic, un- incoherent universe. Um, and and it, and it somehow somehow reprojects and then rebinds the relationship of that ideality to what's actual and apparently material, and and that oneness, as you say, this sort of this 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 fractal recreation of the same pattern at different scales, is when that erupts into consciousness, when that occurrence when you catch it in the act i find it i find it it's stunning it's like um it's sort of like i don't know it's like it's like witnessing the rarest most exotic animal you know that that is that is out in the bush that you're not sure is real it's like seeing something it's like t- seeing a tiger's stripes through the foliage or something it's like you know maybe without the horror of imminent death but maybe with a little bit of that horror <laughs> you know Terror, and uh, terrifying awe awesome yeah inspiring awful yeah yeah exactly kind of related, just yeah. just just awe and and i i had a um uh, i had i had such a such an experience very yeah. recently which i would hap- happily elaborate more on uh, maybe off off record with you but w- which i'll i'll touch on in broad strokes which is you know finding having a very very vivid dream that was so vivid as to be almost lucid it wasn't technically lucid because i never became conscious within the dream that i was dreaming but it was certainly sorry to interrupt um, I think I said this to John, 
And uh, I did, yeah. And also to Bruce and Lehman on another talk that lucid normally in dream talk means you realize you're dreaming, but there's this other sense of, we need another word, but vivid isn't good enough. No, it's not. But some dreams are so lucid in the normal sense, yeah, light, bright, clear, that they have this ontonormative quality. They it's do. more real than a waking state does. That's right. That's lucid in a second sense. So that's, that's right. That's right. Number two. And sometimes, hey, that... and sometimes there's one and two are combined. Yes. And then there's a third where you know you're in an altered state, but it's not like, oh, I realize I'm dreaming. You know you're in another kind of world almost that's real, even though it's in a dream place. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. You know, without being aware that you're dreaming. So there's all these little subtle gradations of lucidity in dreams. But so I yeah. like that. No, I like that nuance because I because my my temptation, my instinct is to want to call it lucid. But then, but I don't want to be. I don't want to flout the technical definition. So that's perfect. It's lucid in that weaker definition of lucidity um and the kind that lends itself to memory because that's the other thing about dreams right it's like they're so they they're so leaky they they you know they pour out like water in your hands and it's very difficult to keep them for very long which is why time is of the essence you know as soon as you wake up um but this was the kind that was so impressive that it just inscribed itself and it was the kind that woke me up uh and begged to be transcribed I happened to be camping, kind of backcountry camping at the time. So there was something particularly that felt particularly primitive um, about having such a, and it was a one that had a lot of very, very primordial, impersonal imagery. This gets to your collective unconscious reference, deeply impersonal, primordial imagery and temporality too, right? The experience of going back in time. It had all the hallmarks of a classic Jungian dream that descends past the personal unconscious into the collective. I don't have many of those. So to have one that was so striking and vivid was eventful. And I knew to pay close attention to it. Anyway, there was a particular figure that presented to me in that dream that was unmistakably archetypal. And Nine months later, and I don't think I'm, I'm. I wonder how coincidental that is that it was about nine months later. I was uh, I was in Italy for a few weeks very recently, back in uh, July into or June into the beginning of July, um, and I spent a lot of time in Rome. And I I really I I really love Rome, and I hadn't been there for many many years. And getting back there, and a lot of this has occurred to me since being there. And I've spent a lot of time trying to articulate out exactly what it was that happened. But with the benefit of hindsight, I can say that there was something about being there in that place, which is so abundant in beauty and in age and has a certain kind of kinetic energy. There's a certain libido in Jung's sense of libido, in the deep sense of eros, in the deep sense of it, you know, the encompassing sense of it. There's so much of it in that city. And the city also has a very kind of Roma. It's a very feminine countenance as well, right? Rome is a she, just as the church in the Catholic tradition is a she. So there's all kinds of stuff going on there, you know. But what I realized in retrospect is that being there again and being so flushed with, with the with the vitality and particular kinetic frequency of that place was like being in an augmented state of mind. It was a friend, of, uh, talking to a friend of mine afterwards, Amar, he, he actually made a very insightful observation. He said, sounds like it was a, almost a psychedelic experience. And it kind of was not drug-induced psychedelia, but a psychedelia that came from the extension of a certain kind of ideality into, by projection, into an edifice that was beautiful and vivid in its symbolism enough to accommodate it, represent it, and manipulate it. And so I had this experience of being in a place that provided a kind of psychic augmentation. And that softened, I think, made the whole experience of my attention much more porous, so enamored as I was of its beauty. Now, this is all a prelude to say that 
after spending a, a little bit of time in Rome and being so deeply sensitized to the dialogue with that beauty in which I had the luxury of something I don't have in my quotidian life, which was the luxury of sitting down for hours on end with a, you know, with an espresso and with a beer or whatnot, with a notebook and just watching the world spin around me, which is just one of my, it's one of the, it's one of life's greatest delights as far as I'm concerned is just lingering in a place and allowing the time in, in like Byung-Chul Han's idea of lingering, right? Just this idea of, of descent, of, of seeing, of, of opening a space within time where some sense of eternity can incur. And Dolce that's a place far that's niente. so... Dolce pardon? Far, Dolce far niente. Dolce far niente. Esatto. <laughs> esatto. Così. Così. <laughs> On a deeper and, level. Not yeah. not just the, from the passeggiata. No, 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 <laughs> no. Exactly, exactly. L'umbra dell'anima, you know, something like that. And 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 so something about that kind of that sensitized relate getting into a different relationship with time because that's bound up with all of this somehow, right? Our relationship to time and the experience of the eternal therein. And this sensitization of beauty and the retrieving, the projection thereof off the edifice of something so old and so vivid was like living in a dream and was like continuing to wake up inside of it. And so after a period of time being in that state, uh, the day after I left Rome, I was happened to be in a, a garden in a nearby uh, city called Caserta. And I came across a scene that was identical almost to the scene that had occurred in that dream nine months prior. And because it had been preceded by this long, lingering, contemplative, dialogic relationship with this imprint of beauty projected out and then retrieved in this augmented place, it struck me like thunder. It was just like, I've never experienced anything quite like it. It was absolutely astonishing to me. And what's remarkable about it, and I think what is remarkable about all of this, these kinds of instances of synchronicity, is that they come with a certain kind of, not certainty in an epistemic and a classical epistemic sense, right? Of, you know, justified true belief or anything like that. But there's a certain kind of conviction that there is comes an stamp on it i call it gnosis it's... that's it yes it, it that is what it is yes Immediate, yes intuitive clarity and certainty there's a quality of realness to it that's stronger than any kind of inferential knowledge or even ordinary perceptual knowledge that's right that's yeah, right whenever that's happened to anybody that's right they're inoculated at least on some level from ordinary physicalist metaphysics. Yes, exactly. Exactly. All right. It might not be a perfect inoculation. It might, no. be, it might be like the COVID vaccine <laughs> where, where if you get a dose of physicalism, it won't kill you. It won't make you a nihilist. You can shake it off. But, you know, it, but yeah, it, it, it is like an inoculation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's that I that's a, that's what an analogy. I like that. I like that. That's the one I use because I've had so many of those. I've gotten many boosters, uh, metaphysical boosters. <laughs> um but I still, you know, fall under the spell of doubt when I'll read a book sure. by Sam Harris or something and I'm like, sure. uh, how do I how do I, you know, sure. assimilate Absolutely. this with my but and so but I do feel like I have a kind of um a good immune system for, for uh, you know, dealing with these kinds of challenges to things that you, when you've had these Gnostic experiences, you just can't dismiss them. No, no, you can't because they don't allow themselves. They're self effusive. They don't exactly. allow themselves to be dismissed because what's being articulated is the expression of a relationship with being itself that has somehow deepened beyond the measure of expectation. It's something connected with what Socrates called his daemonium. Yes, 
that's it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this is a divine sign, Socrates said. It's some kind of sign of divinity. It's, you know, maybe that's not the right word, but it's, but it's, some, but it's, it's sacred. Good enough. Ontonormative. It's good enough. Yeah. You know, I don't mind that's that good. word. I love that story. <laughs> well, it, this, the first thing that came to, I mean, your question, I mean, it's your question was so bloody timely because this has been, <laughs> this is, I've been riddled with this, with this preoccupied with this and trying to, after the fact, well, I mean, one thing that's so fascinating about moments like these, you know, synchronistic experiences is that they like, they land like thunder. And like I said, and, and then, and then there's a great deal of time afterwards, if you have the luxury of it and the, and the presence of mind to do it, where you can then just begin to like un, unravel them. You know, it's like something happens that's so there, that's such a dent, there's such density to it, right? There are so many folds of it that are all somehow telescoped together. And then what then the subsequent contemplation can do is it can begin to telescope it all back out again. And you can see that, you know, the, the, you can see all of those constituent elements that make it that much more uncanny. All of those nested patterns that were reproducing themselves in different aspects of the experience that all seem identical. As you say, there's a oneness and, um, and it inculcates an experience of faith. And I mean it in the most like technical and religious sense yeah. that that's the inoculation. I think you speak of it's like, I had, I, I, it was like, Oh, this is what, this is what faith feels like. This is what, you know, and, and that's a, that's a profound, you know, that's a profound thing. And, um, and I think many of us, myself included find a, you know, a, a dearth of it in, ordinary waking life and spend a great deal of time trying to, as you say, become more accident prone to it, right. you know? Um, well, I think in a way you did answer my question <laughs> well enough, circuitously, well enough, well enough for one conversation. A heck of a question. So what about the free will thing? Did you want to, you know, what's so funny about that, Rick, is I think we've sort of been talking about it the whole time without talking about it explicitly. Like one of the things, for instance, that I, I wanted to ask you about, you know, after I read your paper and, and, and understanding, and, and it, I, I was, I think I was going to say to you before, it kind of brought me back because like the Frankfurt piece that you the Frankfurt argument that you bring into your paper is one of the has to be one of the first things, one of the first papers I ever read, you know, when I was starting to get into philosophy, that oh, Frankfurt right, paper. Right. Yeah. The one that about Frank the hierarchical will. Yeah. The yeah. higher and lower, lower order desires. And, and I remember being so this idea of this reformula, first of all, the differentiation between freedom of will and freedom of action, which is just like, it's so bloody obvious when you lay it out that way. But I think it's such a, it's a conflation that is so automatic to our thinking that it takes some doing to disentangle that. So that was, that was so striking to me, this idea of, um, of um, then this idea of reformulating this idea of, of free will being wanting what you want to want, which sounds so funny, but it's what a pithy way of describing that, that rather than being an expression of your capacity to flout the constraints of nature or somehow undermine fatalism or determinism or indeterminism, as the case may be, that it rather than being an expression of your capacity to flout some kind of universal law that is exterior to you and impressing itself upon you that will as so much more an expression of the way in which you stand in relation to yourself, an expression of integrality or lack thereof, an expression of a self-relation and the coherence and harmony or lack thereof of that relationship. And understanding it in that way contra that typical action oriented you know man versus world man versus nature kind of formulation 
makes it such a profoundly Socratic undertaking, or in your case, a Buddhist undertaking, um, in the case of your paper, I mean, in the case of the argument you made, that um, that it made me also think of something more that that calls to the existential tradition, beginning with with folks like Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, which is this idea that, like especially in Kierkegaard, the idea of freedom, paradoxically, freedom, true, proper, existential freedom in the ontonormative sense is that fundamental metanoetic shift in attitude that allows you to become what already you are, to know what is as it already is. And rather than freedom of the will being associated with defiance or autonomy or independence, it is in fact much more connected to this right of return to become what is already but with intention and therefore to make it de novo and i know in your paper you talk about this idea of of, of um you have an acronym for it and forgive me i can't remember what the acronym is but the this self like a, a causa sui oh. this i this idea of being a causa sui uh not in the sense of not in the sense of not in a temporal or historical sense, but in an existential sense of that something about accepting and accepting sounds very passive. So I don't really like that word, but making the decision to make possible what is necessary to apply yourself to what is and make it real by virtue of a willful intention is something like overriding the incidence of yourself to make it intentional and to therefore be in some sense a kind of causa sui um and you uh, uh, re self recall there's a there's a term that you use for it yeah well the libertarian guy uh, robert kane was the guy who said that an agent in its initial act of self-formation is performing a self-forming act right which is also a self-willing act right. in a way because by performing your first self-forming action you're forming the kind of self that you are right so sfa self-forming action. Self and, I, action and i said well buddhists practice in meditation detaching themselves from their volitions and so they're they're performing self-unforming actions yes um, or SUAs. Um, yeah, this is just semantics, but, but what, what the causal functional thing that they're referring to, and, and they're, inter, they're, 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 they're kind of related, a self unforming action, well, you're deconditioning the previous structure of yourself, but in, in doing so, you're reforming yourself at the same time. So you're right. also self forming whenever you perform a self unforming action. You know, there's a lot more to it that's just one paper that I've written on this stuff. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. That was the one I think. Um, it's a 2020 paper. Yeah, and the philosophy East and West is the journal yes. that it's Yes, in. yes. I forget the title of the paper, but 2020 philosophy East and Buddhist, West. Buddhist soft compatibilism. Oh, thank you. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> I should know that. <laughs> no, no, you've written many. You, you shouldn't know that necessarily. Um, but, um, but this idea of that the paradox of that that this idea of self formation or self authorship or self causation um is has something to do with the way that we treat the endowment that we are and the way we establish a reflexive relationship between those higher and lower orders of desire and will um, and I think you make a very persuasive argument that Buddhist practice effectively is a way of synchronizing those things and developing a, a kind of conversant, functional um, ordering between them 
that and because you stay within this as far as i understood it please correct me if i'm wrong but because you because you're talking about this in a metacog in a context of metacognition in a in a meta mental framing you're also avoiding this sort of infinite regress of those higher order desires being manipulable by you know external influences that right that's kind of where frankfurt's as far as i understood you that frankfurt's argument of these higher order desires threatens to bottom out if there are orders of influence that could sort of regress infinitely upward and because you you contain the argument and the arena to this metacognitive context you kind of get around that problem a little bit because it becomes about training and reconditioning those boundaries did this sort of am i in the ballpark do i yes, kind of have that are. right oh yeah and like one of the standard objections to frankfurt's model is that it implies that a volition or a desire is free a desire at level x whatever the level is right like your base desires that would be level one but we'll just call it level x because we want the criticism uses this abstraction almost like an algebraic whatever the level is a desire at level x is free if and only if it is approved by the agent at level x plus one right right but okay but what about the desire at level x plus one? Oh well that's not free Oh, so you're free at the first level, but you're not free at the second level. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, then you need X plus two at ad infinitum, right? So that's the uh, the infinite regress objection against Frankfurt's model. Right, right. Yeah. Right. So what, like... So one of the ways in which my model gets around that is just by saying that... Um, the agent is a kind, I don't use the phrase, but I should have. It's an, the agent is an auto poetic process that um, it, it, especially an advanced Buddhist practitioner agent is one who's capable of not being determined by the process, but of determining the process by detaching from these volitions of disapproving of those and approving of those because in the eightfold path the first two stages whatever you want to call them are right view and right intention so what right means is oriented toward enlightenment mm -hmm. right so uh, we'll just focus on the second one, the volitions or intentions. So if a desire is going to cause more mental bondage for you as a Buddhist, because it's like an addictive, lustful, whatever it is, right? Uh, and and buying into it, it's going to only, you know, make you less soft, to use your metaphor earlier, right? It's, it's not uh, skillful. The, the Buddhist will disapprove of it and won't water it by acting on it. It won't feed it. It'll disassociate from it. And so the Buddhist is deconditioning him or herself from being someone who identifies with that desire. Right. Because we're volitional beings and we are the collection of our volitions. That's our character, right? Right. right. So, so the point is that the process is kind of functionally autonomous in a way. Right. You know... Uh, over time. And it, I, I made the argument that it doesn't matter if the process is deterministic, indeterministic, if there are even external manipulators, planting desires in a long term, virtuoso meditation athlete, it doesn't matter where the desires arise in their psychology, they right? Approve, they, they cultivate the skill. It's a it's an embodied muscle you know, psychophysiological skill of saying that here's a desire. It doesn't matter if it's mine, if somebody implant a psychic ventriloquist could have put it in my head. Somebody could have put a chip in my brain that causes that desire. It doesn't matter. Determinism could have put it there. Random in indeterminism could have put it there. Right. The long term meditation practitioner has a kind of mental freedom. Right. He or she views the contents of their own mind, like dream phenomena that they could approve of or disapprove of, reject or accept. 
Right. Right. So they are function. They're causally functionally. They have mental freedom. Right. So it doesn't matter what the metaphysics of their desires are. The, the, right. the Frankfurt objection doesn't apply. Doesn't apply. Okay. So let me make sure I've done this. Is there are the... many different ways of making that same argument. Right. But but and I've made them many different ways in my different papers. So that sort of so okay. So it's sort of like saying that that whatever. You know, you have the relationship between X and X plus one, X plus one being the higher order desire and X being the lower order desire. Right. And so I, I want a piece of cake. That's level one. And I don't want to have diabetes. I don't want to gain weight. I'm, you know, I want to be healthy. I might even have spiritual ideas about eating wholesome foods, you know, some kind of um, Ayurvedic philosophy or something like that. Yeah. You know? And so. I disapprove of on the second level, I disapprove of that desire for the cake. Right. And if I'm effective, if my will is effective, if I have the will that I want, that means all the levels of my will. If mm -hmm. I have the will that I want, then I because I disapprove of that lower order desire, I don't act on it. If I do disapprove of it and I act on it, I have a divided will. Mm -hmm. I don't have an integrated will. I have weakness of will. That's what Frankfurt says. Weakness of will is. Mm -hmm. Right. And if I have chronic weakness of will, I've got some kind of failure or breakdown of will. Um, but if I if and this is what you said, if I approve of if my will is harmoniously integrated, I have the will that I want to want, then I am the kind of being that I want to be. Right. I accept my fate. And so if it's deterministic, then I'm I'm fortunate. But there does seem to be a causal functional feedback loop in autopoiesis where yeah. I can actually shape my trajectory over time. Right. And improve. I can decondition myself from the kind of will I didn't want to have before I became a little enlightened and then realized I should be more of a compassionate being, more healthy, whatever. Right. And I can make myself that way over time. Right. Now, the whole thing might be deterministic. It might be infused with indeterminism, determinism. Part of it might be manipulated by circumstance or by some evil demon. It doesn't matter when you right. reach a certain level of like these these advanced Buddhist practitioners, you know, they can control their autonomic nervous systems, you know, more than the average person can. Right. You know? Right. Right. Yeah. So so what's happened like that that the third factor that emerges that models this graduating relationship, let's say, between X1 and X, because that modeling is ultimately an autopoetic process, that from the relation of those two scales of desire, those two orders, what I'm hearing from what you're saying is, I'm, and I'm tempted to think of it just by force of habit, I'm tempted to think of this dialogically, right? I'm, te I'm tempted to think of this as a kind of dawning conversance between these orders and that what comes out of that process that recursive process of refining the relationship and the way that these two orders interact that that creates a model that can recur on itself and refine itself across time so even if you have x plus two that wants to incept things into the model at the lower orders it doesn't really matter because you're not simply you're like those two aren't dis they're no longer separable discrete orders like rungs on a ladder they are in fact they are in fact dialectical opponents in a system that is complexifying itself and therefore is not as susceptible to influence from those external factors in the first place exactly okay Okay. Yeah, the system, it's almost like emergent abilities. That's what it sounds like. Yes, that's exactly what. That's what it is. So yeah. the system operates on a holistic level, which is autopoetic auto and dynamic and self, you know, it's recursive. Yeah. And so it's cultivating this higher order ability, which integrates throughout the whole system. Right. And it's imaging itself as it goes along and reproducing itself and extracting that's the aspirational part of it yes of yeah. course yeah oh what a great argument rick i can see why john cottoned to it so much as well because it goes back to this self-recursive relevance realization argument that he has and the two are quite 
they're quite harmonious. Yeah, I didn't really use that language in there, but he picked up on the. No, but it's there. I mean, it's just a different formulation. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, definitely. I wrote that paper before I saw the meaning crisis thing. And yeah, yeah. Learning John's nice language. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but that that idea of that understanding it dynamically in the way that you have and understanding that what we're talking about are not separable discrete facets of something static yeah, that's just that has a unit way. that has a unidirectional um um uh, i don't know that 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 um that operates because the way frankfurt lays it out I mean, i'm not trying to make a straw man of frankfurt he's, no, he he's remarkably very, yeah. formidable but there is something more linear about the way that he lays it out. And I think what you've done is you've drawn more of a circular recursive pattern in that relationship between those two orders. And I can't help but think of the horses in the chariot, you know, like in the Plato's horses in the chariot uh, and how their coordination uh, uh, and uh, is, is that, that, that same process is happening in that, um, in that, uh, in that arena too. I think, right? Because you have you have this this notion that aligning um the more those more appetitive desires with the rational faculties has everything to do with the orientation of spiritedness that is a product of the way attention is conditioned and that be that third factor becomes the way of modeling and repurposing the entire relationship and changing its nature, right? That's that thumos stuff. The thumos, the thumoides. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Very difficult to pin down. Yes. But yeah, you know, there's a, yeah. Look, Frankfurt and analytic philosophers will create these neat analytic categories to try to isolate ideas and simplify them for intuitive purposes. But as you know, things are much more fluid and complex and interconnected and you know, just one little simple insight about the relationship between the rational and the appetitive that shows how integrated they really are, even when they seem disintegrated, is that you need to believe that something is worth pursuing to give birth to a desire to pursue it. So that's a cognitive thing. You, yeah. view, you have a view that this is worthwhile, it's yeah. attractive, yeah. You know, it's got something about it. And that cognitive thing is the premise, speaking, you know, analytic mm -hmm. mm -hmm. for that desire. Yeah, there's the relevance realization again. Yeah. yeah. And those things are only separable conceptually. Yeah. But phenomenologically and physio psychophysiologically, they're kind of of a piece. And right. they're, in that, they're in that process. Right. So, you know, you you experience something and it has a pleasant feedback to you. And so now you're there's an inclination to repeat that. Yes. You know, um, so then the, the more that you habituate your actions and the feedback loop that you get from them, pleasant or unpleasant, hedonic, you know, consequences of your behaviors that can become dissociated with the cognition that originally thought that maybe that wasn't so desirable. Right. You know, so these things can all come apart. But, you know, John, that's now we're getting into John's territory about, you know, uh, opponent processing and how uh, any psychotechnology can become a virtue or a vice if you yep. don't modulate it properly and everything. But they're all because they're all so intimately interconnected. It can all go haywire or it could all, you know, the, the model I gave is also somewhat analytically abstract, like Frankfurt's about advanced uh, Buddhist practitioners. Whereas the reality of it is it's this ongoing complicated, you know, mess. Um, right. <laughs> right. But right. I'm in a room without a light on. Can you <laughs> still see me? Because the sun is going down. Let me move I, I can still see you. I can still see you, but, uh, but I've, uh, I, I've, I've, uh, I've trespassed on a great deal of your time oh, now, so I we can two hours, but uh, yeah, we can, uh, we we can kind of we can we can gently bring ourselves to a close. Um, uh, Rick, this is great. I uh, yeah, I I I've enjoyed this tremendously.
Yeah, I um, feel like we only skimmed the surface of the free will thing. Maybe we did. We'll talk about it again next time. And maybe Let's, we'll, we'll start with that. We were going to start with that. We were, and then we just... But yeah. No, but I think that um, everything we talked about was very, very rich and um, meaningful and insightful. Yeah. For me. Yeah. Anyway. yeah. I want to hear about that part of the story that you said you might tell me off camera oh well yeah i'll happily tell you off off recording yeah absolutely absolutely <laughs> I'll, I'll happily fill in the details um for sure all right well before we turn off the camera any last uh you get the, the last word christopher the last word is uh the last word is thank you my friend i uh i'm uh I'm so I'm happy and grateful to uh, call you a new friend. And uh, I'm just really looking forward to uh, more conversations with you. That's that's really it. I'm just enjoying this tremendously. Absolutely. Uh, identical feeling on my end. Thank you, Christopher. All right. We'll do this again soon. You bet. You bet. Thanks, Rick. Thank you.